Good afternoon, everybody, and a really well, warm welcome to everybody taking part in this afternoon's webinar for the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Lady Colgrain, or Brother Colgrain, and I'm the Lord Lieutenant of Kent. Um, and I'd really like to thank Josephine McCartney and Beth Peel for having organised this, this really important briefing about the QABS. So thank you. Um, Queen's Award for Voluntary Service provides recognition at the highest level to organisations that are both um, run and led by volunteers. Um, if you like, it's the kind of MBE for the voluntary sector. Um, and it is a wonderful way for the nation, really, to say thank you to all the volunteers who are doing fantastic work out right there. Um, in working in charities and organisations that are supporting the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, but also on a more practical level, it provides that all important stamp of approval that could help you when you're making funding bids, um, get that money in that we all, that we all need. Uh, the tenancy is central to the QABS and it's our job to make sure that the scheme's well known in the county. Because without promoting this scheme, all those wonderful organisations will not get the recognition that they deserve. We've got quite a proud recognition in Kent of having uh, of organisations that have won the QABS. But we're only averaging maybe three or four a year. And I know that there are other, uh, other counties that are doing better than this. And, and we know that there are many more organisations out there who should be receiving this honour in Kent. Um, so our mission is really to get the word out there and make it happen for Kent Charities. Uh, I'm really grateful to Marguerite Weatherseed, um, who runs the national office for the QABS, for giving us the time this afternoon to talk us through the whole nomination process. Um, as you will hear from her, the Lieutenancy is very involved with the assessment process. And the QABS team is led by one of my deputy lieutenants, Paul Austin. Um, who's ably assisted by Jenny Ongley and Joe Holmes in, in the Lieutenancy Office. So if you know of any organisation that you think should be being nominated for this prestigious award, or think that your organisation should be, then do please get in touch with the Lieutenancy Office because they've got a wealth of, of information and will be very happy to help. So with that, thank you. And I will hand over to Marguerite. Many thanks and hello everyone. It's lovely to be able to talk about the award. So it's great to be able to tell you a little bit about this award, which we call QUABS for short, because it's such a mouthful, but it's the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. And uh, it was created 20 years ago now to commemorate the Golden Jubilee. And it's the highest award for local volunteer groups, as Lady Colgrain said. It's actually part of the honours system so um, the other part of my team deals with individual honours. And this is an award for groups rather than individuals. And it's equivalent to an MBE. And because it's an honour, uh, quite unusually, it's awarded for life. So it's, there's no end to this award. And once a group has it, as long as they continue to do what they receive the award for, and as long as they aren't doing anything that brings the award into disrepute, they're allowed to keep that, that, that sort of label ongoing and can use it on their websites and, and stationery and things. And the awards are announced every year on the 2nd of June. So we had a great big announcement on the, um, on the 2nd of June. Great, next slide, please. Fantastic. So, um, who is it for? Uh, th this, this is, a, this is a, a great thing about Quabs. It's actually for a huge range of types of work. Um, there are various eligibility criteria, which I'll go into in a second. But essentially, we get nominations from very, very diverse types of groups, uh, loads of different sectors from sports and arts, heritage, uh, working with very vulnerable people, uh, working with um, uh, very needy families. Uh, environmental, there's a massive range. So um, don't think that there are huge limits on that front. There really aren't. 
but there are certain things which um, have to be part of, of the group. So I'm going to go into those in detail because it's quite good to have a good feel for what sort of groups we're looking for here. So this slide shows a very kind of diverse selection of groups who've all received the award in the past. And they're very different. There are big, there are small, there are urban, rural, lots of different sectors, but they've got three very important things in common. Uh, the first is that volunteers are leading them. And that's more than just having trustees. It means that volunteers really are in the driving seat at every level. There can be paid employees, but they will be receiving instructions rather than the ones you know, organizing everything. Essentially, it's volunteers who are sort of holding the reins, deciding how the group should evolve and making things happen. So they're vol volunteer led. Uh, they're also making big impacts on their local communities. So all of these groups here would have made a great big difference locally and to a high standard. And the third thing they've all got in common is they've all taken the initiative to do things either better or differently to comparable groups. And uh, I think it's helpful if I just describe each of these groups in turn so you can get a feel for what's made them stand out. So the first one on the left is a boxing club in Northern Ireland. And the thing about this boxing club is it doesn't just teach boxing to kids in a very deprived area, which is um, fab, but quite standard for boxing clubs. This one really has taken an interest in the kids' education. So they have a lot of educational mentoring. They particularly get alongside kids who are at risk of being excluded from school. And they just encourage these young people to um, recognize how important it is just to hang on in there, stay engaged, do their best. And they give them practical help with homework clubs and things. So it's boxing, but it's so much more. They've really, they've really thought about the need and tried to meet it in very innovative ways. The second one is a fabulous uh, dance group from Lancashire, which uh, received the award two years ago. And that um, is a sort of run and led by uh, young people with disabilities, uh, learning disabilities and physical. And its whole emphasis is on um, empowerment. So there's been a lot of effort to just make sure that um, they're empowered to, to take leadership roles and really um, just create a very, very high standard of, of performance. So that really stood out as a group that empowers people. The next one, similarly, really empowering. It's a radio station, local radio station in Greater Manchester and um, puts on sort of community related shows. But this one uh, has worked very hard to try and involve uh, groups who are quite marginalized in creating their own shows. So um, got people who've got different um, uh, sort of conditions, like say autism or something, uh, to be able to tell their stories about their experiences, people who um, are from uh, marginalized groups, saying what it's like for them and being empowered to create their own shows and really um, skill up in that sense. So that's a very special radio station. Moving along quickly, uh, this is a tiny group in Scotland on the coast where um, they have tried to revive um, the local economy, majoring on their traditional boat building techniques. So there's a chap here uh, working on a boat and they've taken over old um, disused buildings, created a community hub, um, some tourist accommodation and created a, a boat festival and really made a massive difference to that small place's economy um, and things were quite deprived there. And then finally, uh, this is a group in Wales where um, they have um, made a big difference to a, a, a town where there was a lot of deprivation and um, not many visitors. And so they worked very, very hard to engage local um, institutions and stakeholders to try and work together to um, spruce up the town, but also do a lot of business generation work. So that was very impressive. Uh, next slide, please. So the benefits of the group are they are announced publicly in the London Gazette and also by lots of social media attention on the day, on the 2nd of June. Uh, they get a, a beautiful crystal, which the lady in red is holding. And um, you can't see it very well, but there's a certificate as well uh, with Her Majesty's signature on, which is beautiful, lots of calligraphy and gold leaf. 
uh, they get the right to use the, the logo, which you can see in the top corner there on their materials, their websites, etc. And then in normal times, two volunteers from each group uh, would go to a royal garden party. So that's the year after they would receive the award. Next slide, please. Thanks. So eligibility. Um, all of this information can be found on our website, by the way. So I'll sort of point you towards that in a second. But importantly, there must be at least three members because this is for groups and it should be operating for at least three years. And we mean sort of properly operating. So, you know, at, at a reasonable standard. They should be based in the UK uh, or the islands and providing benefits to a local area. So this isn't for national groups. It's really celebrating groups that are making a big difference locally in their communities. So, um, it, so if you're um, involved in sort of looking for nominations, try to avoid groups which have a spread across the UK because this is really local. Um, so, but having said that, we can have branches of local groups. So if it's a branch, that's absolutely fine, but we would expect it to be doing something a bit uh, differently to just a template handed down. So, you know, just taking its own initiative and really feeling like a group that's driving its work. Uh, it can't be just a fundraising group or grant giving. We're really looking for groups that are doing hands-on stuff. And uh, sadly, animal charities aren't eligible, but if it's therapy dogs, et cetera, that's absolutely fine. And very important, the final point, because this really does uh, matter. Uh, the volunteers have to be leading the group's work, even if they're a staff. This is for, an award for volunteers, um, and that's a very important feature. Uh, next slide, please. So who nominates? Well, it's members of the public. It's not the groups themselves, and that's very important. Uh, so uh, it should be a member of the public who knows their work well. And nominations are made online. And this is the address of our new website. But if you Google Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, you'll find it very easily. And this is brand new. And there's a facility there to click and make a nomination. Um, and you'll be taken through to an old kind of website, which we're currently doing up at the moment. So hopefully next year, it'll all look really slick. But you'll get there properly, so don't worry. Um, but also when you're on this website, before you make a nomination, have a look at, there's lots of articles and case studies now of groups who've received the award. So you should get lots of information there about the sort of thing we're looking for and, and the, the qualities of the group. And that's a, a really helpful resource to give you a feel for it. Um, click on make a nomination, and then you'll need to provide uh, Quite high level information now. It used to be more complicated, but we're, we've revised it to ask you just some basic information about the group, what they do, what makes the volunteers impressive. And then you need to provide two letters of support from two other people, just um, again, so saying some more about what has made the group really special and, and why they deserve the award. Thank you. So again, really important, these points, uh, they must be made online. I'm afraid we can't accept paper forms, but what you can do is download a copy of the form from the website if you just want to see what the questions are and plan your responses. Uh, and as I said before, groups shouldn't nominate themselves. Um, it's it's a, an honor, not a competition. So um, we are afraid can't accept nominations from staff or, or the volunteers or even the trustees. And then um, just uh, really do read the online guidance before to check it's suitable, because we quite often get nominations for groups which are national or fundraising things. And it's, it's a shame um, that people have gone to the trouble of nominating <clears throat> then to be told it's not eligible. So please do check the guidance. Uh, next slide. Quick overview of the process. It's an annual cycle. We're receiving nominations at the moment and the deadline is the 15th of September. So you've still got plenty of time. Then the uh, nominated groups uh, will be assessed. If they're eligible, they'll be assessed locally um, by the Kent Lieutenancy. And that will involve a visit to the group just to meet people and see their work in action. They then, if recommended to us, will come to us 
in the spring, January to March. And there's a very intensive period of national assessment in those months where we have a, a team of national assessors who look in great detail at the nomination material, the assessment reports, and um, take a view on which of those are worthy of the award itself. That goes to the Queen for approval. And then we announce the awardees on the 2nd of June. Next slide, please. And then uh, for groups receiving the award, um, the Lieutenancy will arrange a presentation for the Lord Lieutenants to give out, give out the award. And the format is entirely um, up to the local area. So we don't get involved in that and all sorts of different ways of doing it. And it can be very grand or very casual, depending on what people prefer. So this is just a slide to show you lots of different formats and um, just what a lovely day it is. I know that it gives a great deal of pleasure to everyone. And those happen during the sort of summer into early autumn. Next one, please. So quick reminder, we're after volunteer led groups that are exceptional at the national level and are making a difference locally well run and that's very important so if you're um, considering nominating a group we do need to ensure that for example safeguarding issues are covered and that they have sort of decent finances and insurance even if they're a tiny group just we do need to have groups which are you know being properly managed and then um, running off that as well have an outstanding reputation in the local area and then nominations are made by members of the public, independent of the group. And sorry, that website address will still work, but it does need updating, just spotted. It should be quadsdcms.gov.uk. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you very much, Marguerite. And, yeah. and thank you very much, Bella, um, for the introduction and the presentation. So for everyone listening, um, I'm going to introduce you now to Henny Cumming, who is the Chief Executive of DAVS and one of the previous winners of the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service so that she can tell you what it means to her and the organisation. And then once we've heard from Henu, uh, we will be speaking to Joe Holmes and Jenny Only from the Lord Lieutenancy Office. And that's to answer all of your detailed questions because I know, even though I know quite a lot about the awards, I still have questions and I'm sure you all have questions too. So in the Q&A or in the chat, if you put your questions that have come up from the presentation from Marguerite, that would be great. And Beth Ann Peel, um, who's Chief Executive of Ashford Volunteer Centre, will be doing the Q&A session in about 15 minutes time. So Marguerite, if you are happy to stay on the line um, and answer any questions that might come up, just in case Jenny or Joe can't answer them, although I'm sure they can, but that would be lovely. We'd really appreciate that. So uh, without pleasure, further yeah. ado, great. Without further ado, then over to Henu. Thanks, Josephine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Josephine said, my name's Henu Cummings and I'm the Chief Executive of DAVS. Um, so that's Domestic Abuse Volunteer Support Services. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to tell you a little bit about DAVS, our volunteers, and of course, what it means for us to have received the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. Now, we're a small independent charity based in West Kent, and through an innovative volunteer service delivery model, we provide long-term sustainable support, advice and advocacy services to anyone in Tunbridge Wells, Tunbridge and Morling and Seven Oaks who's experiencing domestic abuse. Now, our volunteer team is comprised of 50 passionate and dedicated individuals from our local community who, quite simply put it, have a natural affinity for victims and survivors of domestic abuse and a strong desire to help and support. We received the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service in 2019 and since then it has been transformational for us as an organisation, for our clients and most importantly for our army of volunteers. Um, it's quite fair to say that volunteering at DAVS is, like, is unlike most other uh, volunteering roles because you end up giving your life to DAVS. We've got an army of volunteers, who've, some of whom have been here for 10 years. Um, that's the longest that we've been running as well. So, um, and 
to be honest, since we received the award, um, believe me, we have milked it at every available opportunity. We were quite well known in the sector before we received the award, um, I suppose because of our unique volunteering model. But since receiving the award, it has pushed us out on to the wider world. And because of my beaming smile, you can see how really, really proud we are of this accolade. Not only has it validated our professionalism as an organization that works mainly with volunteers, for volunteers, by volunteers, it has encouraged and motivated us by the fact that there was a rigorous process in place, which we passed with flying colors. And um, it has also meant that our volunteers, some of whom, as I've explained, have devoted all of their available time to us, have recognized um, that they, they've been recognized and are valued for their hard work, dedication and passion and for furthering the cause of domestic abuse. Now, it has also meant that our volunteers, some of whom um, who didn't quite have the confidence that they could make a difference in people's lives, that it was being recognised. It gave them the, a, a, almost like a, um, something tangible for them to hold on to, a Queen's Award, a logo that we can place on things that when you look at you think, gosh, I am confident. I should, I, I should be um, confident in the processes because that's the, that's the power of that, what that small logo can do for voluntary groups like ours. Um, it has also rather loudly demonstrated to our stakeholders and our partners that a small local charity with limited resources can and does compare with some of the best out there. Um, we're incredibly proud of the award, which is the highest accolade, as Marguerite said, um, that small um, organisations, local organisations can receive. And we're quite proud of the fact that it's an MBE for voluntary services. Now, I was rather personally um, daunted by the prospect of selling ourselves to an outside entity. Um, I, I thought, my goodness, how am I going to demonstrate just how much work goes on behind the scenes by volunteers who literally devote every waking moment to furthering the cause of domestic abuse? Um, I suppose I thought perhaps we won't meet the threshold because we're too tiny, we've got a long way to go, um, and there are other organisations out there who are perhaps more structured than we are. But despite knowing in the heart, in my heart of hearts, that we do actually offer a really, really professional um, and valid internal infrastructure for our volunteers. But um, nonetheless, we gave it our best. And if we were to do it again, I would know now that there is absolutely nothing to be nervous about. Not least because the individuals who came to do our um, site visit were incredibly encouraging, incredibly understanding, took sight of the fact that one may be quite nervous. Um, and they quite literally designed the questions to enable you to get the best, to get the best out of you and the best out of your services. Those two individuals met myself, some of our trustees, and also said, could we meet some of your volunteers? And on the day they came to visit, we didn't cherry pick any of our volunteers. We said, we've got an army in today, about 10 or 12. You can decide who you want to speak to and we'll take it from there. So they got us on the cold front rather. And um, we were asked a few questions after that via email. Um, and then we didn't hear anything for a while. We knew very well that the process, um, like Marguerite described, was uh, quite lengthy and there's a, um, a, a rigorous vetting process in place going on behind the scenes but as far as I was concerned no news was good news and we were all kind of on tenth of hooks waiting for an email or a call thinking did we did we not could we could we not oh it's fine if we don't get it we'll try again so we sort of talked ourselves down from being a little bit too excited um, and then lo and behold we got an email around that June time um, followed by a phone call from um I think it was even Joe, um, who very, very jubilantly told us that we had received the award. And my goodness. And then they said, you have to keep it quiet because um, we haven't announced it publicly. And to close my mouth 
and walk around beaming with pride and everybody going, what's happened? Have you won the lottery? And I'm like, "Mm." Ah, you know. (laughs) So it was an incredibly, incredibly exciting time for us. Um, Really, once a nomination has gone in, I would say you have absolutely nothing to worry about. I would encourage absolutely everyone who is eligible or who is thinking that there is a voluntary service out there is doing a great job, make that nomination because it does wonders for the organisation. We have been so highly regarded because of that um, award and people everywhere who come to see us say, oh, so you've got the award. Wow, that must have been quite tough to get it. And I thought, well, the process in itself wasn't tough, but all the infrastructure we put in place to ensure that our volunteers um, are at the forefront of the services. They, they co-produce everything. They're the ones who lead and make the decisions. And I, I you know, I, I follow it and put it into action. And um, how you get that across can be a daunting process, but it's the people who are there will help you get the best out of you and your organisation. So. I would like to say that it has not only elevated DAVs as an organisation, but it has firmly placed us on the map. I couldn't leave you here today with a quote from our client. So, the last year has been the worst time of my life, as it has been for many around the world. But as a young professional woman, I never expected to find myself even in an ever escalating domestic abuse relationship if it hadn't if I hadn't plucked up the courage and called the dad's team and spoken to a volunteer on the phone I'm not sure I would have made it out alive I am astonished at the level of support I got from people who are just volunteers and I say just there's never such a thing as just their amount of work they have put into my case just highlights for me why they richly deserve the Queen's Award. Now I know why professionals in the industry really seek them out. So thank you all very, very much for listening to me. And I'm sure um, if there's any questions, I'll take them later. Thank you very much, Henu. That was excellent. And thank you very much for the case study at the end, because I think it's always really important for us always to remember why we all exist in the voluntary sector. So Appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Now, can I hand you over to Joe Holmes and Jenny Ongley, who some of you may actually know within the sector. Uh, um, Joe, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? And then, Jenny, just say a little bit about your role in terms of um, the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service and how you might be able to help um, the organisations who are thinking about uh, nominating or asking someone to nominate on their behalf. So um, over to you, Joe. Lovely. Thank, thank you so much, Josephine. And thank you, Henu, for such a, a brilliant um, setting out of, of what it means to, to, to win this prestigious award. Um, as I say, my name is Jo Holmes and I work um, for the Lord Lieutenant, Lady Colgrain, um, alongside my colleague, my partner in crime, Jenny Ongley. Um, I think over this last 15 months, um, I think we've all obviously had to change um, you know, the way in which we work. Um, and I think really rely on um, the, the, the networking that, that we've all done over that period of time. We've all become very much closer. Um, I think f- um, speaking on regards to the lieutenancy, um, we have really become close to, to our charities and to our um, partner agencies around the county. Um, and I think from that, we've drawn together the fact that, you know, we can, as one group of people, um, make a success um, of something and I think what we decide is that we're going to pull all of our expertise um, into really um, pushing strongly um, to to get as many of our wonderful um, charities and voluntary organisations recognised um, for the incredible work um, that they do to support um, you know, the people of Kent. Um, you know, last year, um, you know, we, we've had so many stories of, of how charities have had to completely change the way in which they work um, and adapt and, and show such a resilience that even they themselves couldn't have imagined that they could have done almost overnight. So I think, um, you know, it's down really, I think, to, to, to Jenny and myself 
to really give you the support that I think you need to just push you nearer to, to sort of taking on that step in putting yourself forward. Because as Henu said, um, it is such an investment for you to, to sort of get somebody to take that time to really show the county what you're all about, you know, what you do. And at the end of the day, you all give your time freely um, to do what you do. And that is such, such a massive commitment and passion for what you do. You know, the very least that we can do um, as a lieutenancy is give you the support that you need to take you um, into that um, area whereby you can get that recognition for what you do. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that we are hopefully to you some friendly faces that you can reach out to us and we can guide you and we can answer any questions, doesn't matter how silly you might think they are. It's a learning process for all of us. Um, but basically we are in it all together. And what we want to do is help you try and get that recognition that you so deserve um, for what you do so, to support us. So um, that's my message to you is please, we are here to support you and do what, what's necessary to, to sort of guide you. Um, through this process um, and on that story I will just hand you over to my colleague Jenny um, who will say hello from her hello I'm, I'm just hoping that you can all hear me um, as we're sharing a microphone um, uh, I just I'm not going to repeat anything Joe said but I've just put my contact details in the chat um, and if any if you have any queries after today or you know if you're thinking about nominating please just email me if, you, if it's something you don't really want to say today but you'd rather put it in an email we as joe said we are here to help we know how many amazing organizations there are in kent and uh, we're so proud to be the kent lieutenancy so we just want um everybody to know how wonderful you all are so nothing nothing is too small any queries you have we are more than happy to help um and you will probably hear from me in the process it's usually me who organises the assessors to come and assess your group at the bit that Henny was talking. So at that stage in the process, if you have any queries as well, again, anything, just um, contact me and we're more than happy to help. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Joe and Jenny. So um, in the chat, uh, Jenny has uh, put the email address. So please do um, contact through Jenny and obviously Joe can pick up on some of those as well, if there, those questions. But Beth, I'm going to hand over to you now to, to do the Q&A session and we're bang on time, everyone. So well done. <laughs> We've got 25 minutes to, to now dig into the detail and, and ask all the questions. And um, Beth, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A, but there's quite a lot in the chat. So can I, can I start with the first question and can I kick off with the first question, which is in the chat from me, which is, who can nominate? Uh, um, and so, George, any for that, and then back to Beth to do the rest of the questions. A charity, so a trustee or a volunteer or a member of staff can't nominate, but anyone can. So, a beneficiary of a charity can. So, you know, anyone that um, uses the service, they can. Um, nominate someone or anyone in the community who knows about the charity and knows um you know the amazing work they do they can do it as well um i saw another question in the chat which i will just refer to that asked if the organized you know the people who run the charity can help and i would say i don't know if marguerite wants to say something different but i would say yes i would encourage that only because sometimes when it comes to assessing the or the group we can find that sometimes information is is, is not quite, doesn't add up, but that might be because the nominator didn't know the specific details when nominating the group. So I would say that the nominator could check with the group, but Marguerite might have something else to say on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely correct. I just, just dip in to say, we've deliberately made the nomination form much simpler now, because we, we do recognize that in the past, the group itself did need to be consulted because it had all sorts of questions about you know how long the how long the leader had been in place and stuff they couldn't be expected to know but now we we hope it the questions are so basic that a nominator should be able to fill in almost all of it if not all of it without going to the group but we, you know if if they need to check details with the group absolutely fine what we're just trying to avoid is the group filling it in themselves 
Um, because that's you know a real shame. It's not how it should work. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Margarita. While you're here, can I ask you another question? Really, it's really hard to understand in terms of numbers how many people get the award. I love your enthusiasm and passion about going. We're going to get more. What does more look like? And things sometimes go a bit cranky, and, and organisations as they grow may not be ready yet. Or things. If someone's knocks at this, was two parts. What happens? So, can you talk us, give us some idea of numbers? It is, and. What, what your thinking is on that thank you sure so there's no there's no quota um we tend to award about it tends to land around 250 each year so it's not many this is a really prestigious award and um when groups are nominated it's important to realize the bar's really high so it's it's a real achievement just be nominated and don't be disappointed if you don't get it because around half the groups normally don't don't get it so just to manage expectations there, but it's around 250. This year it was 241. And they're spread right across the UK. But again, there's no, there's no kind of quota for each area. So there's no reason at all why Kent shouldn't get more. You know, there's no limit to how many Kent can get. It's all about the quality of, of the groups themselves. So um, what was the other question, Beth? That, that was, no, that's great. So you're saying oh. there's... It's go for it. How many from Kent got it last year? So oh, trying to remember. Was it was it um, Joe and Jenny? Was it, was it five or three or? So so it's, so it's three. three. It's a handful. Yeah. But we've got lots of room for potential because we can see who's come to this meeting. We've got lots of room for potential. My question is: Say you fill it in. It is. It's not successful. Can you talk us through the process? Because there's a good process in place for for groups and what happens next. Thank you. There is. So if it's just a sort of technicality where, so for example, if the group themselves did nominate themselves and it got booted back as ineligible, then we would let it come again the following year. But if it's been assessed and decided that it wasn't good enough for the award, it has to wait three years. And the reason for that is that, um, that there should be sort of evidence that it's, it's developed since then. And um, otherwise it would just mean everyone came back year after year after year and we'd be inundated and also it would slightly make a, a nonsense of the all the decisions that have been made so it's a three-year thing um and in that time we just would expect to see the you know the, the group evolving and as you said sometimes they're not ready and um sometimes the national assessors will say we think this is a great group but we don't think it's there yet do encourage them to come back and we'll feed that back to the lieutenancy if that's the case That's really helpful. Thank you. I'm not quite sure I was going to pick this one up, but this year has been a year like no other. There's been amazing stuff, but it's also been quite a roller coaster. So as we've gone journey to last year, there's been restrictions in place with COVID. So they're still in place about visits. So how does that affect? Because so, some of the things that groups have done this year have been completely different to other projects. So it's only short term lived. Does that matter? And actually, a really practical thing, if there's social distance in place, have you come up with a conundrum of how visits can still happen? It is assessment because it's happened. What you're thinking about that? So, what does what do people think? If I can just sort of um, come in there, um, Beth. Thank you. Um, certainly, um, with regards COVID, of course, that has had a massive impact um, on the charity sector. Um, we've we've spoken to to numerous charities um, last year. Um, some have absolutely flourished uh, because they've had, um, you know. Uh, policies in place um, and, and they've been able to, to sort of devise new ways of, of, of doing what they would have done in a, in a different way. Um, we found that some um, new groups have, have sort of been formed um, because of COVID. Um, we had a lot of groups that, um, a lot of food banks um, that, that had sort of um, got themselves organised quickly. And this was the key thing that, that they were groups that could turn around things quickly and react to the um, to the to the situation that was unfolding um, early last year. So, in in some respects, um, we've had we've had charities that have ha have adapted the way in which they do their normal work to 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 sort of conquer the the pandemic. We've had uh, new charities or new community groups that have formed that have seen that there has been a need in their local community to put something in place to um, ensure that um, their community has the necessary support mechanisms in place to help them. 
Um, but equally, on the other side of the coin, we have had um, obviously the you know sad stories of, of, of charities that have you know been floundering because they haven't um, been able to have their volunteers you know come in and do their normal thing because of all the restrictions. Um, you know, and, and some have floundered, some are now picking themselves up. Now, you know, we're, we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, but we have still got to, um, you know, sadly take account of those that haven't survived um, the, the, the situation. Um, and it's been very difficult. Um, you know, some are, as I said, picking themselves up and, and, and will be going forward, um, hopefully building up on the strength now. But um, we, we've seen all different sorts of scenarios um, through this dreadful last 15 months or so. So, um, so it's OK if a group has changed its activity from what it did have and has gone to it as long as it's volunteer led. As long as it's volunteer led. Exactly. Um, and it, it's important, to, as I say, to, to sort of mention in any nomination if that has been the case, because it won't go against them if they've had to do things differently or they've had to scale back because of, you know, all the volunteers not being there, you know, that, you know, Marguerite um, and her team will take all of those points um, on board. So and Marguerite, I think you've got some something to say there. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. that just wanted to kind of jump in on that as well, just to say, we did really try last year to make sure that no group um, was sort of left out because of what was happening to them last year. So what we said was, um, historic evidence about the work they were doing before the pandemic was absolutely appropriate, um, you know, on which to base the award. Um, going forward, I just wanted to, to say, this is an award that reflects work that's been done over, over, you know, several years, not just the pandemic year. And I think there's wider work in government to think about how to recognize specific COVID volunteering. So if you're nominating a group for this year, don't make it all about COVID because it will they'll want to look at what the group's been doing over several years. And for some of the groups, you know, COVID will have really brought out the best in them. And as Joe was saying, for other groups, it would have actually really been a challenge. Um, and actually they might not have functioned at all or properly. But if your evidence and your assessment can really look over several years, that's very important because it's not a sort of COVID related awards specifically it's got to look at the history of the group and the future of the group as well. Thank you. Can I just sorry can I just add um, I think part of your question was how were they assessed um, just to let you know that it was the assessments are done in October, November, December um, so just to let you know they were all done virtually which obviously wasn't ideal but we still managed to get it all and you know they had to they emailed evidence and things like that and I think some some assessments took place outdoors at a distance so um, we work around all of that when it comes to the assessments. <laughs> that's great that's great and some of the quick techie stuff when you say about community groups do you just mean charities or have we got scope for the wide and wonderful plethora of groups that are out there to apply it is joe you've got that you've got the things can, can all sorts of groups apply they, they can so long as they're a group of more than three people um i, I think certainly yeah i mean we've got cic um charity that, that have been um put forward so yeah absolutely so you know um there, there, there should be very few barriers, let's say, um, for any group um, wanting to, to, to put themselves forward. Um, and again, if anybody is not sure, if they feel that maybe they're not sort of, you know, that maybe they're not sort of fitting all the criteria, then again, you know, just a conversation with myself, Jenny, um, will iron out any sort of, um, you know, queries yeah. in that regard. So, I mean, uh, just to just to give an example, one of the winners for this year, Louis Helping Hands, is literally run by four volunteers, and that's it. They're a tiny group, but and they contacted us at the time and said, "Oh, we're going to be big enough," but they were because they're more than three, and um, yeah, they were they won. So there's there shouldn't be any barriers to whether you can apply. That's that's great news. It's so exciting. <laughs> nominations are always key, and about when we're publicising, we'll get more nominations and more ideas out there. How much support can we give? potential nominators to understand encouragement what does it look like sort of stuff is it all right to talk about the award with people and just I'm seeing lots of notes on the head so actually with your volunteers it's okay to send this is out here people can nominate that's not a problem I, I think it's got to be the world's worst kept secret we we need people to talk about this process 
Um, all the time we're talking about it, it's in people's minds. Um, you know, we don't want people just to think about it at a certain time of the year. We want people, and that includes the lieutenancy, you know, all of the Lord Lieutenants, Deputy Lieutenants should always be thinking when they're out and about, is this group, this group, they're great. You know, I really think they, sh you know, we should get somebody, encourage somebody, you know, to, to, to nominate them. It's all about keeping it in the mind all of the time. Um, and also, um, again, you know, with some organisations, it, it could well be that there is, you know, outstanding characters, individuals within um, these groups that, you know, potentially could be, you know, in line for, for a potential national honour. So th there's so much that can come out of a discussion about a charity, um, you know, or a community group that is doing amazing stuff. It, it, it just, it's, there's so many opportunities, I think, to reap the benefits for those people that are going above and beyond um, in an entirely voluntary capacity. And I think all of us, um, you know, in, in all of our um, roles should be doing as much as we can to promote that um, and, and get, the, get, the, get the numbers up for Kent um, because we jolly well deserve it. <laughs> You sound like a great champion. And knowing you, you are a great champion. Those sorts of things. Really Margarita, just one of the questions that someone's got. In Kent, we're a good Kent family and we kind of all know each other. So it said about you said about national groups and local groups. What happens, and I'm going to use the street pastors, if there's 10 groups of street pastors, can they be nominated a group or is it just an individual group of street? I don't know what the individual collective is or the group of street pastors yeah, together. Sadly, it does need to be the individual. So say the Tommage Well Street pastors or yeah, it, it needs to be the local group. Um, so I, 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 I know that sometimes things are organised at a higher level regionally, but if, if there's a sense in which the, the local mm -hmm. towns group runs itself and that would be very appropriate so that that's great that's yeah. no that, that's brilliant that's that's really good it's more potential for celebrating more groups in kent at different times yeah so really it's got to be it's just just think local the whole time so if it's if it's a region one that's not so good but if it's the local towns one perfect that's really helpful lady colgrain oh, 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 i feel very oh dare so when when you're looking at you talk with such, with such passion about this this award when you see the groups together have you noticed any Thing that connects the group what things do you get out of it as do you know what I mean with the groups what's your feeling about the award that you can share with people because you're very approachable and all those bits there goodness I don't know um I mean it's just uh, um, as as we were uh, various people were saying like like the, with the street pastors I think you you've got to make sure that it's that what they're doing has made them particularly special in their area um I'm I'm I actually, before I became Lord Lieutenant, I did some assessments and I should say that when we're talking about the assessment process, there is a group of Deputy Lieutenants who are, who are now really experienced <coughs> and they are, will be the, the people who go out um, and do the assessments. Um, and I, I did some assessments be be beforehand and it was just so exciting. It's all very really well to see, see it on paper. What, what, a, what a group does. But the moment that you actually go out there and you meet the volunteers, that's what really makes the difference. And you've got to get that passion through when we, make our, when we, when we write up our, our appraisals to go to the national organization. Um, I can see Josephine wants to say something. No, no, it's fine, Bell. Part but, of the... about the fact that what can make a real difference is a letter of support that, that goes along with the, the application or the, the, the nomination itself. And, and actually, I, I think it would be helpful just to talk about um, what those uh, letters of support look like and who they tend to come from. You know, we, we, where do the strong letters of support come from? I don't know who would like to answer that. Shall I sort of um, come in there? Um, yeah, you're quite right. Letters of support are almost um, as, as, as important, if not more so, than the actual um, citation, because that the letter of support is absolutely ratifying and confirming that the citation is spot on and, in, and, and delivering what, what, what that message is on, on that citation. The letters of support are so important because they could be um, a letter from somebody that has benefited um, from that charity, from that organisation. 
And it could be somebody that has, um, through the contact with that charity, almost been life saving. It's that it's that um, it can be that important um, to somebody. So having a beneficiary um, of somebody that has used, you know, the support of that charity is absolutely crucial as opposed to thinking that if I ask my local MP just to sort of say, yes, I, I know all about this group and I very much strongly support the nomination, it's, it's, it will have no bearing. What will have a real impact, and again, it's all about the impact, is for people um, you know, on the London Committee actually reading a heartfelt letter from somebody whose life has been changed in some shape or form by their contact with that charity. And nothing can hit harder, you know, by anybody reading it is the letter of support that actually clearly sets out what that charity has meant to them. And if that charity hadn't been doing what they were doing, then they may well not be in, in the place they are today. So it is really, really important that those letters of support really hit the spot. So, thank you. yeah. Go for it. Um, and I think just picking up what, what was said a little bit earlier as well about whether it's a, a sort of private process, whether whether they should know that they're being nominated. I, I think unlike the, the, the national honours process, which is very secretive, um, it's, it, it's actually in their benefit to know that, that they have been nominated because then they can get that message out to the people, to the beneficiaries that, that, that might write a letter of support. Um, and then we also have the opportunities, or they have as much opportunity to get the message about what they're doing out. So it's there's there's not a problem about, oh, you know, um, I mustn't let them know, but I'm going to nominate this 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 charity. It's it's a very open process. Thank you. And I just want to kind of before I hand back over to Josie now, Henry, if we were going to give you three words to say what getting the award meant to your See, look, being quiet, you always get caught at the end. You know you do. What three words would you say is it meant to your organisation getting the award? What difference has it made and how has it felt? What would you say? On mute. There's always someone who leaves it on mute. This time it was me. <laughs> um, three words, you've really put me on the spot. But I think just like I said um, earlier when I spoke to you all, it's absolutely validated our professionalism and, and that has given us, particularly our volunteers, the confidence boost we needed to just keep on going because the subject matter is not the nicest subject matter to get the award. Um, we just love looking at the purple logo and we're like, oh my gosh, let's put it on everything. So no three words, I'm afraid, because you caught me at the end, but... I'll take 30. That's brilliant. There you go. Thank you. Lucky <laughs> it's not 60. <laughs> Back to Josephine. Um, we, we've got time for uh, oh. for one more question. Uh, Marguerite. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to clarify and just jump on something that Lady Colgrain mentioned, because she's absolutely right. And uh, in fact, you do have to tell the group you're nominating them because you're going to be giving um, sort of personal details and things and they'll be contacted. So um, it's just for GDPR type of things you, you have to say. Um, you'll be hearing from you know, the lieutenancy in the department. So just to clarify, uh, that's absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. There's um, one other question, Beth, which has just come in, and it actually is about organisations who change their constitution uh, um, for, for various reasons. So it's a local um, radio station, a hospital radio station, and they've had to change their current constitution which makes them seem like a new charity but they've been operating for 60 years uh, um, and the question for someone like that is does that affect their ability to be able to be nominated i wonder maybe marguerite you might be the best place for that that yeah, comment so the fact it's changed its constitution isn't a problem at all. And I think that can all be quite easily explained in the material. And it still looks like it's fairly local because it's not like the whole of Kent, it's, it's West Kent. And so that sounds absolutely fine to me. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Joe, um, a couple of words and then I'll, I'll leave the final closing comments to, to Bella. But 
Um, Joe, can you just confirm again um, the, the the dates for when nominations have to be into the the it's Queen's it's Awards it's actual main office? Yeah, I mean they open from I think the first of April. I think it's the fifteenth of September is 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 the closing date. So anything after that, then I'm afraid um, that the doors are firmly um, firmly closed because it is um, as we've said all online. Um, it used to be paper format years ago, but it, it's far more streamlined and, and, and efficient um, online now. So I'm afraid that once that deadline is here, then then that's it. So if if you know you've got plenty of time at the moment. Um, if, if you're thinking about after having sat today and, and listened to all of us singing the praises of, of putting the work in and, and listening to Henu, um, you know, um, I, I think that, you know, you, there's some work for you to do, I think, after today. Um, and certainly Jenny and I are here and, and hoping that we'll see some emails coming from you um, where we can hopefully guide you if you need guidance. Um, if you don't, then brilliant. You can um, you can get on with um, with with filling out the, the necessary forms. But um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that today, you know, you've been enthused to, to sort of take away some of the, 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 the sort of the, the chatter that we've been giving you today. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, and just to say, um, before I hand over to Bella, that we have recorded this whole session. So you, we will circulate this information as well as the contact details for Jenny and Joe and also the link to the website because people are asking for your contact details plus the link to the website. And hopefully we've answered a lot of questions, but I think really it's, it's important that you understand if you are keen for your organisation to be nominated, that you find the right nominator and that you find the right people to provide your letters of support. I would say that that's, that those are the two key things. So give yourself time over, over the holiday period to find those right nominators and then get in contact with them and help them to help you to make that nomination. Um, Lady Colgrain, over to you for the final words then. Can I just quickly um, say, because I noticed about what if you can't find somebody to nominate, which, which would be un unusual, but I can get be put right by um, Marguerite or Joe and Jenny. Um, am I right in thinking that we could find a, a deputy lieutenant if they know the organisation that maybe we could ask one of them to, to nominate? It, it, it is allowed. It's not really encouraged, but if okay. that's the only person, then that's OK, as long as they're not involved in the assessment. Brilliant. OK. Well, thank you so much. I think this has been a really, really useful session and looking at the, the, the conversations going on in the chat, I think it looks like lots of people will be uh, putting their thinking caps on and thinking about putting, putting them, finding, finding a nominator or um, nominating somebody else. So thank you all for taking part. Thank you, Marguerite, for being with us today, being such a fantastic advocate for the scheme and for um, you know, being so approachable with, with answering the questions. Thank you. And Josephine and Bethan, uh, again, huge thanks for, for organising all of this. It's a, huge, it's, a, it's a lot to get so many people. It's fantastic. We've had, I think, over 50 people join the session today. So fingers crossed, onwards and upwards, let's hope we're going to get many, many more nominations in. So thank you very much indeed. Excellent. I have a Great weekend, everyone, and we'll send around all of the contact details. And Henu, last thank you to you. Thanks Absolutely. for joining us. I'm, how could I have forgotten? <laughs> Henu, that was just uh, barnstorming. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you all.